Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mandology's interview series. I'm Sandy Wright, our education manager, and today I have the wonderful pleasure of talking to Alan Gomon, the director of the Hamilton All-Star Jazz Band. How are you doing today? Great, thanks. Thanks for asking. How are you? I am doing well. It has been a winter, and I'm glad to see it's sort of, we're leaving the winter zone. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do right now. So I am a, a middle school and high school music teacher at Hillfield Strathallen College in Hamilton, Ontario, and uh, that is um, a K to twelve independent school. And um, we're not a, a, a really huge school, but I, we're about eleven hundred people or so. But when you figure, figure that's over the span of grade from kindergarten to grade twelve, that's you know each one of our sort of pockets of schools are kind of you know just a nice smaller community sized school. And so there I teach music to uh, grade six and grade seven. And then I also teach in the high school, um, teaching this year, teaching grade 10 through grade 12. We have like a, uh, a regular instrumental class and then also a jazz oriented class, not necessarily a rep class, but um, just a typical regular curricular class, but geared all through the jazz education lens. So that's what I do. Most of the time, and as you've already mentioned, I am also the uh, director for the Hamilton All Star Jazz Band, and we're so thrilled to be back and uh, rehearsing in person and making music, not through a computer screen anymore. So that's that takes up most of my time um, as a music educator. That's awesome. It's also exciting that you guys are a uh, that you have a sort of jazz focused ability to run a music thing because that was that would have been so exciting for tons of my people that I was in high school with, but also that you guys get the, the jazz band, all-star jazz bands kind of getting back into being in person. That must be very exciting. Yeah. After it's been, it's been a long, uh, almost two years for sure. So we're, we're excited to be back. And, and you talk about the, um, the jazz course at my school. It, it's, it's a pretty unique thing. It, I consider myself to be pretty quite privileged to be able to teach a class like this. And, uh, it's very popular with the students. We we focus on certainly on jazz repertoire, but on improvisation, jazz harmony, composition, analysis, do some transcribing, lots of listening, as you would imagine. But yes, very popular with the students for sure. That's awesome. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, the Hamilton All Star Jazz Band, how that got kind of started. Well, um, it goes back all the way to 1984 um, when I was too young to play in the band. Uh, when when uh, local music educator Russ Wheel, I believe the way the story goes is that um, a, 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 there was a school that where he had like um, it was all the grade 13 music students, uh, and so that was the student the school that he was working with. Um, uh, he was working at that school and obviously you have grade 13 students, you have the most experienced students and they were from all around Hamilton, all going to this one school. And I believe what happened is the school wound up closing. And so now these students were all, didn't have this place to all come to. And that's when he started this all city jazz band program. Um, and so that's back in 1984 now. And over the years, um, there was a sort of middle school aged uh, jazz band that um, I think used to be affiliated with the Hamilton Wentworth board. And um, that ultimately wound up being sort of being adopted under our organization's umbrella. And then we started to kind of realize that um, we had kind of this gap between these, this middle school band and what the all-stars ultimately became Um which the years that I was in it was not necessarily a high school band anymore, although there were some high school students in it. It more became a, uh, an ensemble for, you know, maybe your oldest, most advanced high school students, and then also some musicians who were hanging around in post secondary. Um, so there was this big gap between the two groups. What are you going to do after grade eight when you're too old to be in this band, the, the younger band, and not quite ready yet for the All Stars? Uh, and so then a uh, sort of middle band, which I think at the time was called the Senior Jazz Band, uh, and ultimately became known as the Rising Stars Jazz Band. So, um, yeah, so, um, you know, right now we're we're not necessarily at full capacity in terms of running all of our ensembles, as you would imagine. 
But uh, pre-COVID, we would be running um, three different levels of jazz band to take students from as young as grade six or grade seven and all the way up to, you know, post-secondary and even some, some even a little bit beyond sometimes. Um, over the years, we did have, there was a period of time where we had a, a vocal jazz ensemble for a period of time. Um, but that, I think that that just kind of, there we weren't able to sustain that. There wasn't the interest to be able to keep that kind of group going. You're probably hearing my son now coming through the microphone upstairs practicing the saxophone, and <laughs> he's learning La Vie en Rose. <laughs> well, um, that's thematically connected to what we're talking about. So absolutely. So that's a little bit about the organization. Oh, I mean, we've been... Uh, over the years, the the All Stars have performed. This is the actual All Star Jazz Band has performed. You know, for large events at City Hall. Um, I think for the Queen. <laughs> um, I mean, awesome. like a long time ago, um, has uh, done five five tours to Europe now, including um, each time uh, performing at the Montreal Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Performed at, uh, there used to be uh, an association called the IAJE, International Association for Jazz Educators, which is a mouthful, um, which now is known as uh, JEN, the Jazz Education Network. Um, and so the band performed at at, uh, at that conference, um, recorded lots, performed with lots of some of Canada's top jazz talent musicians uh, as guest artists over the years. It's It's really quite a special organization. That's super interesting to hear that sort of arc from just like this one sort of small demographic thing from basically one school, but expanding into this sort of like multi, I was going to say generational and kind of, I guess, because you were in it and now you're conducting, it, yes. um, directing it. Um, but like this multi, multi-grade multi range kind of covering sort of the whole bandwidth of possible brass instrument playing and sort of what usually happens in jazz instrument playing generally. Um, but for you said when it started in 84, you weren't quite old enough to play in the full, you know, senior all grade 13 students. So can you, but can you tell me a little bit about um, when you actually did first start to start playing, picking up an instrument and sort of had that first sort of experiences with play? Sure. Yeah. Um, I always loved music growing up. I was involved in my school's choirs when I was younger. My my grandfather um, got me interested in that because he sang in his church choir and barbershop quartet and and then also in um, uh, a group called the Geritol Follies from Hamilton, which I don't think are around anymore, but it was a, a really popular group for senior-aged musicians, we'll just say. Um, and uh, it was uh, in grade six, and uh, I, I remember it well. I was at... Uh, a school in Hamilton, which is no longer around, uh, called Hampton Heights on the East Mountain. And uh, Mr. Salato was my music teacher in grade six. And I started um, after trying a bunch of different instruments. And he tried really hard to get people to play like the French horn and the tuba. And, you know, there were there were a couple suckers in the group who uh, who bit. <laughs> um, um, and I wound up... Um, I was I really wanted to play the saxophone. That was the instrument that you know. I mean, like like all young kids, a lot of young kids really sort of gravitate to that instrument. It's kind of the cool instrument, right? So um, I was fortunate enough to get to play that instrument, and and it all started grade six. That's where it all began. Your comments about um, the saxophone thing is very accurate. I wanted to play saxophone, but there were too many people. So I ended up playing clarinet. I went to university to play cla for playing clarinet, but I do find it ironic. But the only reason that happened is because we had too many saxophone players already. Cause it is such like that sort of driving instrument. Um, the sort of from those sort of foundational things, experiencing like, you know, choral music, both in school, but also through your grandfather and uh, those sort of that breadth of sort of musical experience. How did you get from, oh, I play saxophone and I sing in some choirs to, oh, I want to do those two things or variations on them as my job. Yeah, I it wasn't something that I really thought about until later in high school. And even then, I don't know if I really knew what I was getting into. I just kind of, it just sort of happened that way. <clears throat> um, I had a, I was fortunate enough to have a number of great high school music teachers, but it was my, um, a teacher that came to my school in grade 11, the the previous teacher had retired after having taught at the school for like forever. He taught my, he was at the school when my parents were in high school. Let's just say that's how long he'd been around for. And, um, and so um, his name was Rob McGall and he, uh, 
uh, taught me at uh, at West Mount High School in on the West Mountain in Hamilton, and I was fortunate enough to have him there for two years. He was on some he was on a bit more of a you know steeper leadership track, and ultimately wound up retiring as a superintendent in um, in Belleville, uh, for, which is where he's from, his hometown. Uh, so he wasn't there for long, but uh, he had an impact on me for the couple years he was there, and. Um, just the types of experiences that we had in those two years, it just, it really hooked me into music. All of a sudden now mu the music room was the place that I wanted to go to hang out. That was where my friends were. It's where I went and ate lunch, even on days when I didn't have band at lunch. Um, yeah. So that, that was kind of where I got hooked. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I, uh, a, a very close friend of mine, um, opted to, uh, to uh, forego his uh, OAC year in favor of uh, going straight to Mohawk College for music. And I stuck around for my OAC year and he and I kept in touch, obviously. And then I was like, well, he says, you should come and do this. This is a great program. We have these, you know, Mike Malone's here, Dave McMurdo's here, come and learn. So I went and, and then it was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do now. I didn't know quite what I wanted to do with it at that point in time. I was still sort of of the, uh, the mindset that I could, you know, I was going to be this, you know, professional funky saxophone player, and that's where I was going to make a living. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something in music um, at that point in time, and really, nothing. I really couldn't have imagined anything else being something that I wanted to do for you know the the next thirty or forty years or whatever after graduating high school. That's cool that you had that sort of reinvigoration in a program where you just went from oh I'm really enjoying this to oh I this is it this is sort of that becoming sort of a um, educational home, I guess, is sort of the best metaphor I've got. That sort of the band room is a community space is something that comes up a lot when I talk to my peers and when I was in high school and the people I interview in this job. And that's sort of cool to see that play out in a way and have those connections of like, oh, I have someone sort of say, no, come here and do that. Um, and also having that sort of first like major influence of like, oh, this culture, this changed something. And now I know that this is like what I'm pursuing. So from him, are there any other, other like major influences or mentors that sort of helped you along this journey that maybe like, you know, led you to teaching or led you to working like in other parts of like your sort of broad career? Uh, absolutely. <coughs> um, I mentioned um, Russ Wheel as the founder of the Hamilton All-Star Jazz Band. He was actually my music teacher for my OAC year, uh, came to my school, and um, and then I wound up, uh, simultaneously wound up playing in the Hamilton All-Star Jazz Band my first year playing in the band that year. And um, <clears throat> so I learned a lot working, uh, playing in his band, and um, um, so a big influence on me that way for sure. Um, there were, there were a couple of teachers along the way and during my time at Mohawk College in U of T um, that made, um, seemed to make a, a, an extra effort um, in terms of taking an interest in my education. And um, so like people like Mike Malone and uh, the late David Mur Dave McMurdo and, um, and then later on people like Phil Nimmons at U of T and private teachers like Mike Burley, Kirk McDonald, um, all, all really big parts of my, of my progress and development, but also even outside of the, the, um, of that sort of whole arena. Um, I also grew up doing, um, drum and bugle corps, sort of like a, almost like a marching band type thing, right? Yeah. You mentioned you're from the Kitchener Waterloo area. So you, you may be familiar with groups like Dutch boy and Kiwanis Cavaliers and all that from, pre, from way, way back. I don't know. Um, they ring yeah. bells. They ring bells. Yeah, them, they're, they're, they they're bells. not around anymore. So um, it it might have, it might be for quite a while that they haven't been around for. But um, um, my involvement in in uh, that type of group, and there was uh, uh, an instructor in particular um, uh, named Trevor Yule, who's now a really successful um, compo like film and TV composer, writes music for Orphan Black, um, and um, you know had a big influence on me just in terms of. I mean, just all things like like mu general musicianship. Um, so yeah, I mean, like th all those people. I think when I look back, I think you know, I don't think I would be here where I am the way that I am without having had those people in my life. Again, to hark back to like being in chorals and being in choirs and having that choral music part, and then moving into the jazz and the saxophone world, but also having the 
drum and bugle. That's cool. That's just, on the side. I was also a drum and bugle person. That's <laughs> a very broad um, yeah. spectrum, which is broader than what I was doing um, for sure. But there's that's sort of cool to hear that from all those places you sort of got to construct, like had these people guiding you and going, oh, this is something that I want to do. And this is how to like shape myself into having a career where you sort of, you know, come full circle and end up conducting the band you were a part of, um, which is very cool. So amongst those sort of like diverse experiences, um, both in education and as, as you, like when you were in college and doing these sort of broad things, do you have any like highlights that like stick out to you where you go, oh man, that was just a moment that I will treasure for, you know, the rest of my life? Yeah, there's, there's a, I, I thought when I looked at that question, I thought long and hard about it. Cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not like a regular gigging musician or anything like that. So most of my sort of pinnacle performance moments to this point have all happened in the past. I mean, maybe there's more to come down the road, who knows? Um, but a couple that sort of popped into my mind, um, certainly um, that first uh, first tour to Europe with the All-Stars uh, performing, uh, not just at Montreux, I didn't really appreciate at the time how big a deal that was. But that trip, that was like a three week trip. And in that, over the course of that three week, I th three weeks, I think we performed like 23 times. Um, so like some days we performed like twice a day. So getting to sort of really feel what it was like to be on like a real tour and performing that was, uh, you know, pretty, a pretty amazing experience. Um, I mentioned that um, there was um, um, a, a year when the All-Star Jazz Band performed at the IAJE conference, and that was in New York City. And that was actually my last year that I was in the band. I was fortunate enough to be in that group and traveled to New York. And the the coolest thing that I will always remember from that was um, we played a piece um, written by Mike Malone called Mike's Bossa. And, um, and I had a solo on that tune. So I was playing my solo in New York City there. Um, but <laughs> the real highlight, though, was that we also had um, joining us for the trip as a guest artist was um, one of my favorite Canadian musicians of all time, Guido Basso, uh, was with us. And uh, and it was kind of like we were the featured soloists. And of course, I mean, like I'm like, there's Guido and I'm here. But it was still for the moment, it's kind of like, hey, I'm fronting this band with Guido. That was pretty, pretty surreal to have that experience. Um, and then you mentioned the drum corps. So I'm just going to uh, um, mention one thing uh, from that. Um, doing this one group that was, you know, from Kitchener, or Waterloo, and we were we were doing competitions all across the U.S., and there was one performance that we did at that we where we did a competition and, and most of these competitions were for like a couple thousand people but this one i remember that was at some somewhere in like some suburb of chicago and um and the audience was like in the tens of thousands um and i was like wow that's pretty cool and all that but there was one point in our performance where something was happening and I'm just out there marching around on the football field and all of a sudden you just hear like, like tens of thousands of people just cheering from the, like, and I'd never heard that before. And I was like, wow, this is just such a cool goosebumpy kind of moment. So those are some things that I'll probably, you know, there's you know, other things I could probably pick out, but those are things that I will always remember. I think. Those are very cool. That sort of experience of being able to be like, you know, regardless of the fact that you're playing with one of the, Canadian greats still being on stage and being like, I'm also the other, I'm the other person that's like featured in this moment. And it's very, that's a very cool experience and getting to be around those, that diversity of like venues and see what like, you know, different concert experiences like because being in a marching band is very different than being in a jazz combo. Neither of those things are things I have been in, but I know they're very different. <laughs> um, yes. Having been in rock bands and wind bands, those are yes. not the same experience though they tend to always still have the same uh, amount of noise happening, which is really, which is ironic and explains why I have tinnitus. Anyway, um, but there, um, for you as sort of a person who's been able to go on these sort of like, you know, youth big experience things and also became a teacher and is now working as a director for an ensemble like that, why is music education sort of important to you? Either both on a personal level maybe, but also just like for a general level for like, why does, why is music education important? why it's important, why, why I think it's important. Maybe I'll start with that part of it. Um, you know, I see every day, I see young people who are just trying to figure it all out, you know, where their place is 
in this world, who they are as people, how they can contribute, how they can feel like self-worth. Um, and, you know, I think for, for some of the kids, they find it in music. Some kids find it on the sports field or some kids find it in the art studio or wherever. Right. Um, but I, but I know, like, and I've had students specifically um, articulate to me that this is where they figured out who they were and where they were able to develop a level of confidence in themselves and, um, you know, belief that they could be successful in whatever it is that they try was through their experience of music. Um, and so, you know, and to be fair, most of these students who, who have expressed this aren't students who went on to pursue music post-secondary, although they could have. Um, this, these were just students who were, you know, deeply passionate for the experience that they had um, and benefited from it in such a profound way that, you know, I'm not sure that they would be, that they would have, that they would be the same kind of people that they are if they didn't have that experience. You know, I mean, I've, I've watched students, you know, in, who I taught in grade six. One of the cool things about my school is being able to teach from like middle school all the way to grade 12 and get to see that progression. But I've watched kids who, you know, were just in such a like a little quiet space shell in like grade five, six, seven, and totally in their element of themselves by the time they graduate. And, you know, I've over and over and over again, they say it's because of their experience in music. So I, I mean, I think that that in itself is why it's so important is to have that for those kids who need to find, who need to find themselves in that venue and who aren't going to find themselves on the, you know, again, on the basketball court or somewhere else. Um, I don't know if it's hard for me to self-assess and think if that was the case for me. Um, but for me, what it's meant is um, just so many wonderful relationships along the way. Um, you know, friends who have been like people who I've been friends with for 25, 30 years. Um, uh, my, my, my wife, I met as a result of music. She was involved in drum and bugle corps as well, too. We were, we were like, you know, competing groups originally, but, but that's how I met her. Um, and so just, uh, I, I, I mean, and, and maybe I would have those, I would have different kinds of relationships, obviously, if I were involved in something else. But for me, it's, these are the people who I met because of music, the like, and those again, like those relationships that are still there. So that's why it's, I think for me, it's such a, a big deal. I think the things that tie those two experiences together, what you've seen as an educator and what you've sort of experienced are that aspect of like music and music education being a place to build like a community and a space to grow um, with other people. Um, and I found like when I was a student, that was a thing being around musicians. I was on their music council, which there are all sorts of different names for music councils, but we called it music council because we were very boring. Um, but we, uh, that sort of being in those spaces. And I think that's a very cool aspect of music is that ability to like, you know, have a meet people and get to know them and sometimes through them learn more about yourself and become more confident in yourself because it's a place you can flourish um so that's very cool to hear that um you've seen that you've gotten to see that play out over the course of like six because that's a very unique experience getting to see it over <laughs> basically from adolescent like preteen through adulthood essentially absolutely um, so that's very cool yeah um so for um, those listening that are might be young musicians um, or younger musicians or people who like music, um, do you have any advice to them in pursuing either like your the saxophone or going into a career like yours or just like how to experiencing music and then having it in their life as they go forward? I always kind of think the the students that I teach, um, my hope isn't that they will take the experience and that they will pursue music post-secondary or anything like that. Although, I mean, it's always kind of, you know, you always kind of say, Oh, good. You're, you're going to become one of us when they do. That's always kind of cool. Um, but really to me, it's just, it's, it's about, you know, a, a shared experience that you can have with other people. And, you know, I oftentimes talk to my jazz students about, 
you know, like we we're like we just started up a new semester, so we're just starting with our jazz group right now. And there are some students who are new to the class who've never done improv at all ever before, and some students who've been in for a couple of years who are ready to go. And so we're learning some tunes, and and I talked to them about how the great thing about this type of music is that you know you can learn autumn leaves, and you can you know when COVID's all over, you can take your instrument and travel to Europe and. You can go somewhere and you could run into a bass player from from Germany and maybe there's a you know a drummer from Australia who happens to be in town as well too and a piano player from I don't know Argentina as well and and you could say hey you guys know Autumn Leaves and they'll say yeah who would have no other tie otherwise um, and so I I really try to play up the idea that this is something that can be for the rest of your life you know you can. You don't have to do this to make a living if you don't want to, certainly. You, but it's something that, you know, when you're often studying, um, you know, at my school, we always have a number of students who go into things like engineering and and commerce and things that are like, you know, um, but to be able to have something else to, you know, sort of enrich your life, um, I think is a, is a big deal. It's really important um, for young people who are looking at this as a possible um, career path. I used to always kind of joke, you know, at my school about how, you know, well, we don't have students who go into music because they'd rather eat uh, than, than do that, right? But the, the real truth of the matter is, is that I, I, I really do believe that if you're the right kind of person and you're, you know, you have that entrepreneurial spirit, that, that there's a place, you know, everybody, you, you can find a, a place in this industry where you can, you know, be happy and where you can and make it and make a living. Um, you know, I, one of my, not the one who's playing the saxophone, but my, my daughter is um, really into music theater big time. She really wants to do that as her, she sees her, like her, that's her pathway. And it's like, great. You know, like, don't give up on that. Don't, don't think that it's too hard or that it's not possible or it's not realistic. Um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're willing to, to keep at it and and find some path somehow um there will be a path and i i really do believe that uh one of the things i do with my students at school is i is i actually have them we do like a careers assignment where i say all right we're going to all research a music career but you can't research performer and you can't research teacher because i think most students look at that and they think i'd love to be a performer but that doesn't seem realistic to them and I don't want to be a teacher because look at Sir and he's got no hair and all that type of stuff. And um, so they 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 look into other things. And I've had students before say, like, I didn't know there was something like um, like music therapist, for example, you know, like somebody who's really into mental health and wellness and music. And now all of a sudden is able to consider that as an option. Didn't even realize you can do that for in music. I'm like, yes, you can. You know, so. I, I think it's a lot of it is also it's just awareness and knowing what possibilities are and, and you know there's so many of them so I think that is definitely a thing that when I went into post-secondary education in music there was a little bit of a oh there's a lot of things we can do because I had what I wanted to do and then I knew tons of people who wanted to be teachers and tons of people who wanted to be performers and then there was like 60 other careers that people wanted and were searching for that I didn't know existed and I was you know someone trying to go into it so I think that's a great Wish I'd had that class. Um, that would have, you know, I might be in a different place, not in a bad way, but I might just, you know, think of some things might have come up. Um, so before we kind of wrap up our interview, we do have our fast five rapid fire questions, <laughs> which is answer as fast. You know, if it's interesting, I might ask you a question about it, but answer sort of as much off the dome rapid fire questions as you can do they're just fun get to know you questions they're night nice. they're our way of sort of you know wrapping up the interview on a light note so you ready i am ready question one favorite movie soundtrack this was a tough one but what came to my mind right away was pulp fiction i have never heard that movie soundtrack. oh it's fantastic I it's 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 on my ne- it's on my Netflix queue <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's there. i just haven't watched it you don't need to watch the movie but listen to the soundtrack for sure I, you know, actually, I'll put that on my Apple Music. I'll do that. Question two, instrument you wish you played? Uh, the French horn. I love, there's nothing I love more. I love the saxophone, but there's nothing I love more than the sound of a well-played French horn. 
it is it's it's got a very beautiful sound it's it's like the cello of the brass instruments mm -hmm. um in my mind i don't know why that's the comparisons i make but cello is um, a good option too though <laughs> yeah a lot of people say cello oh yeah it's the, there's a, a couple a lot of it's it's cello and guitar usually um question three um if you have a hill and talent what is it uh i do have a hidden talent and when i tell people this they're always surprised um in a, a way way earlier in my adult life i was a blackjack and poker dealer so you don't want to sit down at the poker table with me oh wow that is cool <laughs> uh, poker stresses me out so that's that's very that seems very cool that's like being a bartender that's that kind of level of cool where you have you can do tricks and you look impressive and also like are doing a cool having a cool job um question four your favorite concert that you attended um <clears throat> excuse me um without a doubt was a was actually a school trip concert and it was we went to uh new orleans and we went to preservation hall and the coolest reason why it sticks in my head is just the coolest concert i've ever been to is because my class or my classmates my students were seated right at the feet of the performers like trombone slide dodging their heads as they played and and just seeing them seeing the music up that close like the look of sheer wonder on their face these are like grade 11 grade 12 students you think nothing impresses them but they were totally blown away by that so that's awesome. absolutely my favorite that's really cool i that's a concert i wish i'd had this is my least favorite question i'll be honest because every time someone tells me a story i'm like man i wish i'd seen that show um <laughs> a lot of them are on school band trips though coincident a lot of the people i talk that's also partially just the people i talk to but a lot of them are on school band trips going like oh man i was we were here and we saw this cool thing question five um what's this is the most pandemic related question and you can substitute <laughs> show for any selected media but what's the last show you binge watched uh, it was yeah, that was the this the first half of the new season of Ozark. Ah, yes, that came out the other day. Very, it was so very short, good. so it was over really quickly. Yes, you know that's just a day. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Day. Straight television watching. Um, yes, so that is our fast five. Thank you so much. Before we go, um, do you have any exciting plans or new projects coming up? Yes, actually, um, mentioned that the All Star Jazz Band is back and um, and rehearsing and performing in person, and we're doing a show uh, at the end of April. We're resuming our artist in residence series, which is something that we've started a few years ago before the pandemic started, and now we're happy to be back doing it again. And so we're going to be joined by Hamilton superstar musician and saxophonist Darcy Hepner. He's going to be a guest uh, guest soloist with our group and be there with his own professional group as well. And and then we are doing a, a concert, uh, what will be our probably our final concert for the year uh, at the end of May, slated to be performed at the new uh, uh, Memorial Performing Arts Center, brand new uh, in Ancaster, uh, still under construction as we speak. So hopefully it's done in time. And we're going to be uh, joined, uh, just confirmed this week, actually, going to be joined by legendary Canadian jazz saxophonist Pat LaBarbera for that one. So um, when I told the band members on this week that that was happening, they all went, are you serious? They went crazy. So um, some pretty cool things happening in the next couple months. That's very exciting. I hope. I hope the building gets finished. Thing one. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> the building gets finished. Um, more than that, I hope those things go really well. That sounds like very cool opportunities all around, um, both for students and also just cool to like be able to play in front of people in a real jazz band setting again for the first time in a few years. Absolutely. Yeah. But thank you so much for coming and speaking with me today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We have stuff go out every Monday and Thursday. And what's your fourth test? What's Your Forte Season 3, our podcast is coming out, just wrapping up um, in a little bit, every Friday at 3 o'clock. So, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy and research, and our play a gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performance and interviews on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube.